for all his fame, he's more humble, or as I told him once, he fakes it better than almost anyone I know. So let's hear it for Howard Zinn. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. As, as Matt said, I'm a very humble person. I'll try to be humble for the rest of my talk, but it's not easy, <laughs> given my enormous ego. Uh, but Matt's told accurately about my coming to the progressive. And I must say this, that I've never had an editor like Matt Rothschild, really. You may wonder, well, what does that mean? I've never had an editor who's a bird watcher. <laughs> really, that's very important. But more than that, he, no, he really is a, a great editor. Uh, he reads everything carefully. Uh, he doesn't give you a hard time, and uh, that's the sign of a good editor. Uh, so I'm very happy to write for the Progressive that the readership of the Progressive is a very special readership. Well, there you are. <laughs> you're, you're out there. Very, yeah, really, they're very special readership. Uh, a peculiar readership. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In a good way, yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm happy to be uh, introduced by Matt. I'm happy to be on the same platform with Will Durst, whom I've never heard. And, well, he is a very funny guy. <laughs> and, uh, and happy to be on a program with, with Barbara Ehrenreich and Bob Redford. Yeah, this is, it's, you know, I'm honored. So now I will try to sober things up a little. Um, by, I thought I would introduce an idea which I've been toying with, uh, and I thought this is a good crowd uh, to introduce this uh, idea with, you know? Uh, and it's about three holy wars. That's my, sort of, in my title, in my head, that's my title of, of this talk. Although it's not a very formal talk, but three holy wars. What does that mean? I'm not talking about religious wars. I'm talking about the three wars in American history that are sacrosanct. The three wars that you cannot say anything bad about. Uh, the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War II. Ever hear anybody say anything bad about the Founding Fathers? <laughs> about uh, the Civil War? Uh, about the Good War, World War? No, it's very, very, very hard in our culture to be critical in any way of these wars. Oh, you can be critical of other wars. <laughs> and there's sort of a, an acceptance of the fact, oh, this was a bad one. <laughs> this was a bad one, but no, no. The Revolutionary War, the Civil War. So I thought, yeah, I thought it was very important to look very critically and carefully at these three idealized wars. I guess the word idealized gives me away. <laughs> uh, yeah, three, three romanticized wars. Uh, important important to be willing to at least raise the question. It's not that I'm going to immediately denounce these three wars. Well, maybe. <laughs> no, but, well, I, I don't know how to characterize what I will say about them. But uh, I think it is important at least to raise the possibility that you can criticize something which everybody has accepted as uncriticizable. <laughs> I mean, that's what uh, we are, we're supposed to be thinking people. We're supposed to be able to question anything. I have just heard Barbara Ehrenreich question God. 
and I didn't hear an answer. Uh, I'd like to hear an interview between them, which Matt can publish in the Progressive. Uh, but uh, yeah, just to, if we're thinking human beings, we have to be willing to question everything, including these wars, which nobody wants to say anything bad about. And so that's what I'm, I'm going to just start to do, because it's, it's a very big topic, and I only have a little bit of time, and I've been warned about time. They have a guy here who warns you, and he's a very tough-looking guy. And he, he warns you about time. So I only have a bit of time, just enough to introduce a few ideas, just to think about. Okay? Uh, one, of, one of those ideas is actually something uh, Matt mentioned Erwin Noel. Uh, and I don't know how many of you knew him or read The Progressive when Erwin Noel was editor of The Progressive. But yeah, I met Erwin Noel. And one of the first things that happened when I met Erwin Noel is that we both uh, found that we both had exactly the same idea about a certain thing. That is, we were both making the distinction between a just cause and a just war. That is, there are th things that happen in the world that are bad and that you want to do something about. And so you have a just cause there. But our culture is so war prone <laughs> that we immediately rush and make this logical jump from, oh, this is a good cause, therefore it deserves a war. <laughs> no. You have to be very, very careful in making that jump from, oh, th this is a good cause, to, oh, therefore we have to make war to do something about it. No. The, uh, well, it was uh, actually, uh, you might say it was a good cause to uh, get Spain out of Cuba in 1898. Spain was oppressing Cuba. But did that necessarily mean, therefore, we had to go to war against Spain? Uh, you have to examine that war very carefully to see what it produced. You know, you have to see, and you have to then understand that we got Spain out of oppressing Cuba and got ourselves in to oppress Cuba. <laughs> so, that, very careful. You might say that uh, stopping North Korea from invading South Korea was a, there's a just cause there. They shouldn't do that. It's not good. It's not right. Does that mean, therefore, we should go to war to stop it? Especially if that war, and, and you know the Korean War is one of the least known wars. It's sort of a, a war that's been lost in history. Two to three million Koreans died in that war. A, cause, a just cause. North Korea should not invade South Korea. So we go, what's the answer? War. What's the result? Two to three million Koreans dead. And is there any particular change in the alignment of South Korea and North Korea? No, it starts off with a dictatorship in South Korea and a dictatorship in North Korea. And it ends up, after two million dead, with a dictatorship in South Korea and a dictatorship in North Korea. I have to be very careful about rushing from one thing to another from just cause to just war. Uh, and Erwin Noll is the only other person I found in who was thinking exactly along the same lines. I'm always looking for somebody who's thinking along the same lines as me. That's what I do. I go around looking for people. <laughs> Very gratified when I find somebody. The, the American Revolution Independence from England, a just cause. 
Yeah, why should a group of colonists here be occupied by, yeah, they were occupying us, they were, uh, yeah, oppressing us, uh, therefore we go to war, the Revolutionary War. How many people die in, in the Revolutionary War? Oh. Nobody knows exactly. By the way, you'll find out when you look at the statistics of war dead that nobody ever knows exactly how many people die. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> but 25,000 to 50,000 people die. Let's take the lower figure. 25,000 die in the Revolutionary War in a population of 3 million. That would be equivalent today to 2.5 million people dying in a war to get England off our backs. Well, you might consider that worth it. Or you might not. Canada is independent of England. <laughs> Aren't they? I think so. <laughs> not a bad society. They have good health care. <laughs> they have a lot of things we don't have. They didn't fight a bloody revolutionary war. Why do we assume that you, why do we assume that you had to fight a bloody revolutionary war to get rid of England? Do you know that I always start off saying, do you know, because I figure people don't know this and they'll be gratified that I'm telling them this. <laughs> that in the year before the first shots were fired, those famous shots, were, you know, the shot that was heard around the world, you know, Lexington conquered April of 1775, the beginning of the Revolutionary War, that the year before that, Farmers in western Massachusetts had driven the British government out of most of western Massachusetts without firing a shot. They had assembled by the thousands and thousands around courthouses, around official uh, offices, and, and, and they had just taken over and they said goodbye to the British officials. It was a, a nonviolent revolution that took place. But then, came Lexington and Concord, and the revolution became violent, and then the revolution was taken over, not by the farmers, but taken over by the founding fathers. Uh, farmers were rather poor. The founding fathers were rather rich. Uh, the Revolutionary War is not as simple as it first seems, you know? Oh, independence from England. Good. Not that simple. Who actually gained from that victory over England? There were people who gained. No question about that. Who, but it's a very important to ask, especially if you're considering a war or evaluating a war, who gained what? And, and differentiate among the different parts of the population about who benefited from a certain policy. That's one thing we're not accustomed to in this country because we, we don't think in class terms. We think, oh, we're all, we all have the same interest. We all have the same interest, independence from England. We did not have all the same interest. Do you think the, in, do you think the Indians cared about independence from England? No. In fact, the Indians were unhappy that we won independence from England because England had set a line, a proclamation of 1763, had set a line and said, you can't go westward into Indian territory beyond this line. And they didn't do it because they loved the Indians. They didn't want trouble, right? When Britain was defeated in the Revolutionary War, that line was eliminated. And now the way was open for the colonists to move westward across that, the continent, which they did for the next hundred years, committing massacres and making sure that they destroyed Indian civilization. So you're going to say, you know, when you look at the American Revolution, hey, there's a fact that you have to take into consideration. The Indians, no, they didn't benefit. Did blacks benefit from the Revolution? Slavery was there before, slavery was there after. Uh, no, and we remained a slave society after the revolution. Not only that, we wrote slavery into the Constitution. We legitimized it. Uh, what about class divisions? Why do we assume, well, aside from 
blacks and slaves and Indians? What about just ordinary, let's say, white farmers? Did they have the same interest in the revolution as a John Hancock or Gouverneur Morris or Rich or Madison or Jefferson or the slave owners or the bondholders? Not really. It was not, it was not all the common people getting together to fight against England. They had a, Washington had a very hard time assembling an army. Uh, well, they, they've got an army. They promised people, they took poor guys and promised them land. Uh, they browbeat people and, 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 oh yes, and of course they uh, inspired people. Well, let's have the Declaration of Independence. Wow, this is what we're fighting for. It's always good if you want to get people who go to war to give them a, a good document and to have good words and life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Yeah, that's what we're fighting for. Of course, when they write the Constitution, it's not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When they write the Constitution, it's life, liberty, and property. Have you noticed that difference? You should notice. You should take notice of these little things. There were class divisions. When you assess and evaluate a war, when you assess and evaluate any policy, you have to ask who gets what. <laughs> and out of this policy, it's not, oh, the same for all of us. Oh, we're going to raise taxes. On whom? On which part of the population? We're going to spend money. On whom? For No. And what about the revolution? Uh, is there a class division there in the benefits of the revolution? And Oh, yes. We were a class society from the beginning. American, American society started off as a society of rich and poor, of people with enormous grants of land and people with no land. And there were riots. There were bread riots in, in Boston and flower riots. And, and there, were, there were rebellions all over the colonies of poor against rich, of tenants breaking into jails to release people who were imprisoned there for non-payment of debt. There was class conflict. We try to pretend in this country we're all one big happy family. We're not. And so when you look at the American Revolution, you have to look at it in terms of class. Do you know that in the, again, my air of superiority, <laughs> Did you know what I know? <laughs> well, I know you know things that I don't know, but I may as well take advantage of what I know to lord it over everybody else. <laughs> Do you know that there were mutinies in the Revolutionary Army by the privates against the officers? I ask you, do you know? Because when I studied the American Revolution, when I studied American history, and I'm talking about not just in elementary school, I went to graduate school. I want you to know that. It's, I, I got a PhD in history. Really. Did I ever learn in my whole undergraduate, graduate education, did I ever learn about mutinies in the Revolutionary Army? No. Well, there's a lot I didn't learn. When I got out of school, I began to learn things. That's when you begin to learn, right? You go to the library. There's nothing like a library. And there were mutinies of ordinary soldiers who saw the way the officers were treated. The officers were getting fine clothes and good food and high pay, and the privates were, well, you saw the Valley Forge and the no shoes and the bad clothes, and, and they weren't getting paid. They mutinied, thousands of them. And not, not just five or ten, thousands of soldiers mutinied. So many, the mutiny in the Pennsylvania line, as it was called. George Washington worried about this. It was too, too much to handle. He couldn't put this down. So, I'm sorry, so he made compromises with them. But later, when there was a smaller mutiny in the New Jersey line, not with thousands, but maybe with hundreds, Washington said, execute the leaders. 
and they took out a number of the mutineers and they were executed by their fellow mutineers by order of the officers. I tell you this just to indicate that the American Revolution was not a simple affair of all of us against all of them and not everybody thought that they would benefit from the revolution. And sure, it was a benefit to be freed from England, but in proportion to population, two and a half million people die, right? Uh, there's a, a, when considering war, the human cost needs to be measured and against what you gain from war. And on both sides of that ledger, problems arise because when you think about the human cost, generally it's an abstraction. Oh, so many and so many people died. It's a number. You give it a number. Uh, World War II, uh, 400,000 died. Civil War, 600,000. The, the World War II, 50 million people died in World War II. Yeah. But it becomes, what does that mean in human terms? Uh, so the tendency is on that side of the ledger, if you really want to have an accurate assessment of weighing the cost against the benefits, you have to look at that cost not as an abstraction, not as a statistic, but you have to look at it in terms of every human being who died and every human being who lost a limb and every human being who came out blind and every human being who came out mentally damaged. You have to put all of that together when you are assessing that side of the ledger, the cost of the war, before you ask the question, well, was it worth it? Was it a just war? Was, you know, yeah, you have to get side, that side of the ledger right. One of the things that, great things that Drew Gilpin Faust did, I don't know if you know about her book, the uh, book she wrote about the Civil War. Uh, it's a wonderful book. The great thing about her book is she brings home in very explicit, very human terms, the what happens to human beings in that war. The Civil War was an ugly, brutal war of amputation after amputation after amputation done out in the field without anesthetics, you know. Uh, so you have to have a careful assessment of that. And then on the other side, okay, this is the cost. You have to, now you know the real cost the real human cost. And on the side of gain, you have to ask the question I asked about the Revolutionary War. Who gained and who didn't? And what were the class divisions? And what did this class gain and what did that class gain? I'm looking to see if this guy is following me. If you see somebody creeping up behind me, let me know. Uh, um, in the Civil War, again, we learn about the Civil War, North versus South, the Blue versus the Gray, battles, Antietam and Gettysburg. Hey, who in the North, who in the South, what divisions were there? Well, um, it was a war to, to free the slaves. Uh, but also, there was a class element to it in that poor white people were conscripted into a war which didn't have much meaning for them and where they were being drafted and where the rich could get out of the draft by paying $300. And so there were riots. Probably a lot of you have heard about the draft riots that took place in New York and other cities during the Civil War. Yeah. There was class conflict in the North. There were some people in the North who got rich during the war. There were fortunes made. J.P. Morgan made a fortune during the Civil War. 
And that's what wars do. They make some people very rich. And the poor go to fight in the war. Okay, I agree. That's, I mustn't ignore the positive side. And I'm going to come back to that. But yeah, emancipation, freeing the slaves. That's no small matter. That's a big thing on, on that side of the ledger. But let's say one more thing about class conflict in the Confederacy. There was class conflict in the Confederacy. Most whites were not slave owners. Maybe one out of six whites was a slave owner. Whites were not slave owners. Whites were poor, poor, poor jokers <laughs> fighting in this war. For what? And dying at a much higher rate than the soldiers of the North. I mean, the Confederate losses were greater proportionately than the losses in the North. And, and as the mayhem went on, as the, the bloodshed magnified, their families back home were starving because the plantation owners were growing cotton instead of food. And so the wives and the daughters and the uh, girlfriends and sisters, and they began to riot. They rioted in, in Georgia and, and Alabama. They rioted uh, in protest against the fact that their uh, sons and husbands were dying at the front while the plantation owners were getting rich. Huge desertions in the Confederate Army. This class thing had to be examined. But let me come back to the great positive thing that happened out of the Civil War the emancipation of the slaves. Except that it was not totally an emancipation. Uh, yes, in a certain sense it was, in another sense it wasn't. Uh, now that's important because if you're going to lose 600,000 dead in the Civil War, which is equivalent proportion of population to five million dead today. Imagine a war in which we wage on our soil, state against state, in which five million people die. Well, maybe it's worth it if you really result, the result is to free four million black people, bring them into freedom. Well, they weren't exactly brought into freedom. They were brought into semi-slavery. They were betrayed by the, by the politicians and the financiers of the North. They were given promises and promises. But sure, they were no longer technically slaves, but they were, they were left without resources. They were really left at the mercy of the same plantation owners who had owned them as slaves. And now they were serfs. Now they were tenant farmers. Uh, now they couldn't move from one place to another. They, could, they were hemmed in by all sorts of restrictions. And, and, and many of them were, were put in jail on false charges. They, they had vagrancy statutes were passed so that employers could pick up blacks off the street and force them to work, kind of slave labor. I say all this just to indicate that, well, that business of, well, it may have been OK to, for 600,000 people to die because we ended slavery. Not quite. It's possible that slavery could have been ended another way without 600,000 dead. That's something we don't think of. Just like we don't think of, could we have won independence from England without a bloody war? The thing about bloody wars, the thing about winning something with violence is that that is controlled from the top. The, it's, it's not a people's war. It, n neither the Civil War nor the Revolution War. It's not a people's war. There are people at the top. They're the ones who gain the most you know, out, out of this situation. And uh, so you have to ask the question, yes, could slavery have been ended another way? There are other countries in the Western Hemisphere that ended slavery without a bloody civil war. Other, still have a green light. <laughs> because you know, I was wondering if I'd be able to get to World War II. <laughs> uh, and uh, um, 
which I volunteer be, to be in. Maybe you know that. Maybe you know my, my whole history. Maybe you know more about me than I do. <laughs> but yeah, I volunteered for the Air Force in, in World War II and flew bombing missions over Europe. I did it because it was a good war. It was the right war. It was, it was just war. It was, uh, yeah. Uh, well, after I got out of the war, I began to think and think sometimes and research and so on and, and go back over things and, and learn about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because when, when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and I had just finished my missions in Europe and was going to go to the Pacific to continue dropping bombs and a bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and the war ended soon after, wow, that's great. I welcomed it. Did I really know what happened when that bomb was dropped on Hiroshima? Did I know what happened to those people? Did I, did I have any idea what that meant to those hundreds of thousands of people, of men, women, and children? No, I did not. When I began to think about that, and then began to think about the people under my bombs, whom I hadn't thought about, I never saw them. <laughs> Flying 30,000 feet, you don't see anybody. Just drop bombs. You know, warfare today is a very antiseptic thing. You know, people blithely, they send predator missiles, even, well, without any pilots at all, right? You know, it's, that's easy. We'll just kill people, and we won't even take any chances of having anybody shut down. Three months before Nagasaki, we, we sent planes over Tokyo to firebomb Tokyo, and 100,000 people were killed in one night in the bombing of Tokyo. I mean, later when I visited Japan and I, I talked to people there, and later when I visited Hiroshima and I met with people who were survivors of Hiroshima, and you should have seen them, or well, people without legs and arms and, and blind and so on. Uh, when I began to see what that, uh, you know, uh, meant, that war, the, the 50 million dead in the war, and well, I, well, you say, well, we defeated fascism. Did we? <laughs> Did we, really? <laughs> That's another thing, you know. So you find that a revolutionary war, well, the, not, not everything turned out well after the revolutionary war. Not everything turned out really that great after, and certainly not to warrant that many people killed. And what about World War II? 50 million people dead and, oh, sure, you got rid of Hitler, you got rid of... <laughs> of Japanese military machine and Mussolini, but did you get rid of fascism in the world? Did you get rid of militarism? Did you get rid of racism? Did you get rid of war? We've had war after war after war. What did those 50 million people die for? You have to rethink this question of war and come to the conclusion, I think the guy who's monitoring this has fallen asleep. <laughs> And, and believe me, I am not going to wake him. <laughs> uh, what you have to come to conclusion, as, as I have, war cannot be accepted, no matter what. what the ex no matter what. War. Yeah. You know, no matter what the reasons given, the excuse given, liberty, democracy, this, that, you know, no, no war, war is by its, by definition, the indiscriminate killing of huge numbers of people for ends which are uncertain. If you think about means and ends, you think about that ethical proposition in, and apply it to war, the means are horrible, certainly. The end is uncertain. Uh, that alone should make you hesitate. And then, of course, people always ask the question. I've always this question has always been asked of me, and so I'm, I'm going to uh, uh, preempt your asking it, <laughs> even in your s head. <laughs> yeah, but what else were we to do? This is what people ask. What else are we to do about this, about that, about independence from England, about, about slavery? And, you know, 
By the way, an interesting thing about slavery, John Brown wanted to free the slaves. <laughs> this is a year before the Civil War, right? He tries to start, wasn't very good at it, but he tried to start a slave insurrection, hoping that would, you know, it'd be, it would spread and spread and spread. Maybe they'd end slavery that way. He's executed by the government of the United States and the state of Virginia for using such violence. <laughs> the next year, they start a war which ends up with 600,000 dead, and everybody is celebrating that slavery is ended in that way. Well, uh, well, yeah, just one point I want to make. This is a question that says, what else would you do? And they say, what else? Yeah, but Hitler, you had to do something. Had something about Hitler. I agree, you had to do something about all these things. You had to do something about winning independence if you're oppressed. You have to do something about slavery if there's slavery. You have to do something about fascism. You have to do something about all these things. But you don't have to do war. Yeah. You're there. You have to, if, if we have any brains, I don't know if we do, <laughs> but it, we are supposed to be smart. We are smart in so many ways. Surely we should be able to understand that in between war and passivity, there are a thousand possibilities, you see. And, but it's curious that once, once a historical event has taken place a certain way, that is once history has played itself out in a certain way, you know, oh, Hitler invades Czechoslovakia, Poland, we go to war, war lasts a number of years, the war is over. Once it has played out in a certain way, fascism is over. Once it's played out that way, it becomes very hard to imagine that you could have achieved that result some other way. You know, it's because there's a, when, when something has happened in history, it takes on a certain air of inevitability. This is the only way it could have happened. No. <laughs> no. Uh, and you see so many instances in history where things, surprising things take place that you wouldn't have imagined. I mean, if, if the, African National Congress had decided on a bloody war of rebellion against the apartheid system, well, that might be justified. Get, end apartheid? Yes. They'd, there would be a war. They'd end apartheid. Maybe a million people would be killed, mostly black people. And if it happened that way, then you would say, well, I guess it was the only way it could have been done. Apartheid ended because the African National Congress decided, no, we don't want that. We're going to do it another way. We're not going to be passive. <laughs> We're going to fight back in various ways. We're going to have strikes. We're going to have all sorts of things. We're going to have economic pressure. We're going to do all sorts of things to bring down this regime little by little to erode its power. Yeah, but we're not going to have a bloody war in which we are going to be the victims, mostly. Anyway, a few, so, Ah, finally. <laughs> You're saved. See. Well, you get my point, <laughs> right? That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs>